12 years of their life making a film like this. Um, you know, what, what drove you? What, what was your passion for putting this on film? Well, my, that's an easy one. I'm starting you off with an easy one. Uh, it's an easy answer from my friends and family who suggested I probably needed to go into psychoanalysis. Uh, uh, in, um, I was working as a field producer for CNN, uh, and I spent a number of weeks in Vietnam for the 25th anniversary of the end of the war. And while I was there, I met a number of journalists uh, who had covered the war who were still working as journalists. And there was also a, a reunion of journalists uh, who had retired who were also there. And uh, sitting around the uh, rooftop bar at the Caravelle Hotel or out on some of the assignments that I had, uh, I heard a lot of wonderful stories from a lot of very interesting people, and that suggested to me that uh, uh, I might want to, uh, to do something more with these stories and with these characters and the history behind it. Now, this assignment to Vietnam uh, uh, was a, a sought-after assignment, uh, and I, was, I, I really wanted it, uh, and this may also go to uh, an answer to your question. I, uh, um, had been very interested in the Vietnam War. It was uh, important to me as a as a very young as a boy, and, uh, and 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 as I got older, it was probably the most important event in my young life, and and perhaps uh, remains so. Uh, I remember as a as a young boy at a summer camp, sitting around a campfire. I was probably 11, 12 years old, maybe only 10, uh, debating the camp director. She said, well, I'm not so sure about, uh, uh, about this war. This, and this was probably about the time uh, uh, this film was, uh, uh, the subject of this film was going on in the mid-60s, maybe. Um, and I was saying, oh, oh no, no, uh, uh, Mrs. Thrall, uh, uh, we've got to stop these communists. You know, they're going to take over the world, and uh, we're going to have to be fighting them in Boston or, or Los Angeles unless we stop them there. Well, a few years later, I was uh, in college and marching against the war with many of my classmates and friends and parents' friends, uh, and this really gave me an opportunity, this film and that trip to Vietnam, to take a look back and say, what was this about? What, what was going on then? Why did I change? What happened to the country? So kind of a rambling answer, but uh, 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 that's what drove me to this, uh, uh, to this uh, 12, 13 year odyssey. Right, right. And, and the journalists, I mean, amazing characters, individuals, a lot of people that are familiar even today or in recent time, uh, because as they age, they, you know, continue to do their craft and you saw people who made, you know, continue to be on TV or write, you know, for the newspapers. It, it's uh, now when you went to that reunion. Uh, what year was that again? Uh, uh, two uh, thousand. Okay. Um, what was the general feeling of the journalists at that reunion after you know a number of years had passed? Twenty-five years had passed. Had they changed at all their attitude towards you know how they reported? Like you mentioned in the film, I think one of the journalists mentioned you know did they do too much? Did they say too much, or we didn't we do enough? I mean, what was the general attitude you know after twenty five years of, of those people there? Uh, a couple of points. Um, uh, no one felt that they did um, too much. Uh, no one I talked to. Uh, many of them felt, uh, many of them went over still in thrall of the Cold War attitude that Neil Sheehan very emotionally described, David Halberstam as well. Um, what struck me in addition to that was that to a man and to a woman, and uh, in the course of uh, making this film, uh, I interviewed uh, some extraordinary female correspondents who unfortunately didn't make it into this film. I hope uh, we can put Gloria Emerson and Frances Fitzgerald and Kate Webb and others uh, in another project or in an expanded uh, web version of this. But to a, to a man and a woman, 
that experience in Vietnam was the most important uh, experience in their professional lives. Right. And these are people who have led varied and very interesting lives. Um, broader question, uh, and again, this is maybe we'll open this to the audience. I mean, historically, you're a historian. I mean, you covered this subject very, very well, but I know you're a historian, and, and so in general, has the U.S. ever had a free press, <laughs> in your opinion? Yes, uh, we have. Um, it's never completely free, and um, it's always uh, a struggle to maintain that freedom. Now, we, uh, we saw what was happening well, now 50 plus years ago uh, in the 1960s uh, to David Halberstam, Neil Sheehan, uh, the others in this film, um, and uh, the suppression of the freedom and the lies was visited on them and others uh, by an administration uh, that to me uh, had always been uh, uh, heroic, uh, and in many ways John Kennedy is still a, a, a hero uh, to me. Uh, part of what I learned in this film, in researching and making this film, was I didn't know this. Right. Uh, uh, now today, um, uh, well, Malcolm Brown said, you know, to him, too often the world was made up of journalists and truth suppressors. Well, what's happening today is, is much more egregious. It's not just truth suppression, it's not just distortion. It's, it, it's much, much worse in uh, words that I don't want to use in this theater. My point, however, is that uh, the struggle uh, of journalists and the public uh, to get to the truth, to understand the truth, to hold government accountable is something uh, that is constant. Uh, that. Uh, uh, this generation, prior generations, and generations before, and generations after uh, the current one will continue uh, to struggle for. Just curious, these journalists operating, you know, 50 years ago, obviously 50 years later, the world and the information flow is totally different, uh, you know, with the advent of the internet, web, uh, blogs, you know, all the different apps that, that are available. Uh, did they express any opinions on sort of the current, you know, uh, way that news is gotten and, and disseminated? Did, did they have any interesting comments about that? Yeah, they did. Uh, uh, the, uh, while filing was very difficult, and I heard some very amusing stories about how to file a story, today uh, a journalist can you know, be out uh, in the desert in Syria or Iraq or uh, in the mountains of Af Afghanistan and call their editor on a, uh, on a sat phone or file a story from their computer immediately. Of course it works the other way too. The editor can immediately get, uh, get to a journalist wherever he or she is in the world. Uh, what uh, Halberstam and Sheehan and, and Peter Arnett uh, used to joke about in Horst Foss, the, that great German photojournalist, is they could go out uh, on, uh, on a patrol or on a story and disappear for a week. There was no way that New York was going to be able to get a hold of them, so they had the time to delve into a story, to take a much deeper dive, uh, to report more thoroughly than, uh, than journalists can. Um, I'm hoping that some of you have questions. We'll throw it out to the audience if anyone has a question. Doreen, you've got your hand up first. Please try to state as loud as you can. We'll try to in repeat the, it. In the 1960s, I had a Vietnamese girl, a graduate student at Marquette, where I was in attendance, stay with me. and live in our home. And in your film at the beginning, you talked about the South Vietnamese soldiers not being terribly interested in fighting. I was shocked when she was being dated 
by Vietnamese boys whose parents had extricated them from Vietnam to avoid the war. And they were in Wisconsin where I was living while our country boys were fighting their war. Could you comment on why the South Vietnamese soldiers weren't interested in fighting? Well, some w were very good fighters. I, I don't want to uh, paint broad brush that every one of them was not, but too many were not. And the reason was that they didn't believe in the mission of their government. They were poorly led. Uh, too many of the, the generals, and we had General Cao as one example here at the Akbak battle, uh, were in their positions not because they were particularly skilled military leaders, but because they were political supporters of uh, President Ziem. Uh, so they did not have faith in their superiors, they, uh, in the military. Too many did not have uh, faith in a, gov a government led by a Catholic in a largely Buddhist country. So the government did not have the support of too many soldiers and of too many uh, citizens of the country. Now we can, uh, I don't want to say that history repeats itself, but Mark Twain uh, famously remarked that history rhymes. We can see that uh, happening, uh, or having happened not, uh, let me say, a number of times since the scenes in this film uh, occurred, uh, including uh, today, and I think uh, uh, it's so important that we un we need to understand better uh, our allies with whom we're fighting. But that's another subject. So, right, right. I hope I I hope I answered your question, man. Thank you. Yes. Any, any reaction from the Kennedy family or Democrats, given the portrayal, especially in the context of today's times? You know, what, what has been the general reaction at your screenings? It, you can specifically uh, speak to that question, but in, in general also, what has been the reaction to uh, the screening of the film? I'll answer your second question. First, I've been very gratified uh, that people uh, uh, who come to see the film, and there haven't been a great many public screenings of it. I think this may be the sixth or seventh. Um, but uh, I've been gratified that people uh, are engaged. Uh, I'm gratified that those who lived through the war, the historians and the politicians, do not take issue with the uh, accuracy of the history that's being portrayed here. Uh, so as a filmmaker, that makes you feel pretty good. Now, as to your question about the Kennedys, uh, I, uh, I have not heard directly from the Kennedy family. but. I um, can tell you that the second public screening was held at the JFK Library in Boston. And I was invited uh, by uh, the executive director of the library and the president of the Library Foundation, um, both of whom I think are unfairly characterized as wanting to continue a Camelot-type myth, type myth in the mission of that institution. Uh, but that simply isn't so. They wanted this aspect shown as well. Uh, and one more point about the Kennedys. Uh, uh, as, as I hope you uh, and others in the audience saw, uh, President Kennedy was really conflicted by this war. Uh, he, um, I think, felt that it was difficult, if not impossible, to win, but at the same time, he was unwilling to pull out. Now, what would have happened had he lived? We'll never know in the historian's debate. Yes, Mark. Tom, thank you. Uh, everybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, louder. louder. Thank you so much. I am, it, this film has overpowered me. I am totally overwhelmed. So, thank you. My heart will, is beating in a different way. Feeling is so strong, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yes, uh, I have a question about maybe a little more general uh, about uh, the news uh, establishment today. You talked about how the uh, uh, speeding up of 
of uh, news production has an adverse effect on death. Uh, what, what do you think about the way in which uh, reality television, fake news, assert assertions of fake news combined with commercialization uh, pressures the entire coverage of news in a way that's different and perhaps even more deleterious to the search for truth. Uh, I'll try to repeat the question. Um, the uh, speed uh, with which uh, news is gathered and disseminated, uh, the coverage of uh, issues which uh, may not uh, uh, be of critical importance uh, uh, tends to demean the news. Is that... Uh, uh, the loss of truth. The loss of truth itself. Yeah. Another piece of the puzzle. Well, uh, I think you you've uh, laid your finger on it. Uh, uh, the, the truth in a lot of important news gets crowded out through people's tw Twitter feeds, uh, things uh, that aren't that important. What? Well, we all know some of these things, and. and, and also, some important news gets crowded out by whatever latest uh, uh, melodrama is occurring in the West Wing of the White House, uh, or in uh, you know uh, a rally that President uh, Trump uh, has organized uh, in, in in some state. Um, we aren't hearing, for example, of very important events that are re truly affecting the security of this country in Northeast Asia. Uh, in the Middle East uh, and elsewhere. Uh, I think that combined with a cutback in uh, international news coverage, um, with newspapers, uh, television uh, networks closing their bureaus overseas, and the point that you were making that uh, 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 TV networks are, you know, concerned about ratings uh, so they can sell advertising at higher rates. And I understand it's a business, but that tends to crowd out important news and important truth, and I think that's something we all need to be concerned about. I was really fascinated with the, um, the tapes of President Kennedy uh, speaking in the White House, and I'm just curious, um, where are they, and do we have tapes right now of President speaking in the White House? Do, and, um, do you think Kennedy did not know at the beginning? Was he being lied to by the generals who were there on the floor? Like he really was not sure what was happening. I'll try to repeat the question. What's about the the uh, White House tapes, the Kennedy White House tapes? Um, where did they come from? Uh, how did I get them? Are there tapes uh, today? Um, uh, which the current occupant uh, of uh, the Oval <laughs> Office has. I, well, he's answered that question, whether you believe him or not. Uh, uh, I leave that for everyone to decide. But as to the Kennedy tapes, it's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, one um, benefit of uh, taking 12 or 13 years to make this film was I was able to get a hold of those tapes. I knew that tapes existed, uh, and I had read uh, reports of some of these meetings, but I didn't know if the, those meetings and the excerpts that I wanted from the reports I read were actually taped. Um, and uh, these tapes were, all of the tapes you heard in this film um, were classified. I knew that there was a tape numbered 162D, 163A through F, and so forth. They were classified and held uh, either um, in the Kennedy Library under classification or in the State Department. And uh, I kept pushing the State Department and the, uh, the United States government, uh, the National Archives, uh, uh, to, uh, to try to declassify them further. I've, I've got to film, I've got to get it made. People are asking for it. I need to know if, if these tapes are there. Uh, but it, they uh, declassified them at, uh, at their own leisure. And uh, for, I, I was really fortunate when I was, when these tapes were declassified, and it was just 
about a year and a half or so ago, um, I was able to get most, but not all, of what I wanted. Uh, when I heard, for example, the tape of John Kennedy uh, saying, you know, asking his uh, his two advisors if they went to the same country. I mean, that was, for a documentary filmmaker, that's gold. Uh, when I hear the President of the United States in the Oval Office talking with the Secretary of State and other uh, National Security Advisor, worrying about what these, you know, 20-something guys named David Halberstam and Neil Sheehan were doing, you know they were making an impact, whether they pretended they were or not. So it was, it was great. Thank you for asking. Uh, where are they now? Uh, some of them actually are online. Uh, if you go to the JFK Library or to the Miller Center uh, at the University of Virginia, which has some of them online, and some of them are, in fact, at the um, JFK Library in Boston, and some of them have not yet been declassified. We'll go up here first, and then we'll. You lauded these uh, journalists, and for good reason. But I wonder if you left out a group of journalists who came before them, the alternative press, who talked about what was going on in Laos and in Vietnam long before these people. I'm thinking of uh, I.F. Stone, people like that. Well, as I understand it, I.F. Stone uh, did some remarkable reporting and remarkably prescient reporting, but he did not report from Vietnam. Now, uh, that's my understanding. Um, the, uh, why I focused on these five is they were among the very first to be critical. And as we learned from them, it wasn't easy. They had to overcome uh, a lot of uh, the baggage they brought into it. I interviewed over 50 uh, journalists, writers, uh, TV reporters, photojournalists, radio reporters, uh, historians, and others um, uh, from the beginning of the war, even before uh, uh, these five, Stanley Carno, for example, maybe one of the people you were thinking of, who uh, was reporting in Vietnam and elsewhere in Southeast Asia uh, in the 1950s. Um, but a filmmaker has to decide what the story is, and I can't put everyone in, and, and sometimes it's uh, Richard and other filmmakers in the room may understand it. It's like cutting off a finger or an arm uh, to try to fit, uh, fit it and craft a story into a, a length that people will, uh, will sit through. Exactly. Yes, gentlemen. I'm interested in Dean Rusk and, and McNamara, both of whom were inveterate liars the president of the Republic, at least during the war. Um, you mentioned they were overwhelmed by the Red Scares and all that of the 50s and 60s, but did you learn of anything about them that suggests to you that they were, in a sense, willing to prevaricate long before the war began? That is, was there something about their personality that made it easier to do this, um, despite the pressures to perform um, as they did? Again, a very good question, um, uh, and I'll have to speculate. Uh, uh, the uh, period uh, in which these m men, and, and they were almost all men who were advising uh, President Kennedy, uh, McNamara, Rusk, and others, uh, they um, really came into uh, maturity uh, and fought in World War II. Uh, and uh, were real uh, cold warriors. So they um, uh, were uh, certain that we had to stop uh, the, uh, the communists in, in Vietnam uh, or we'd have a world conflagration. In fact, for them, the war in Vietnam wasn't really about Vietnam. It was about China and Russia, and Vietnam just happened to be uh, a place to make a statement. Uh, uh, another, and let me respond to a point that the woman in the front row raised a moment ago. Uh, they also were not operating uh, 
uh, under entirely accurate information. You're correct, they were lying, and the Pentagon Papers, which uh, Neil Sheehan obtained, uh, re reflects that over and over and over again. But uh, their gen the generals in the field and, and the colonels and the civilians in Vietnam were not reporting uh, accurately up the line to the president, so they also were operating under uh, with imperfect information. And I think that uh, the combination of, uh, of those things did not make uh, for good decision making.